Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Let us now continue our discussion of Badal Sarkar's plays. Uh, let us now uh, shift to the second play, which is called Bhoma, uh, which uses very similar kind of uh, devices, literary devices, it has a similar form to the previous play we, discover, uh, we discussed in the last session, uh, which uh, again had, uh, you know, uh, which was called Procession or Mitchell, and uh, both Procession as well as Bhoma. Um, have uh, uh, anonymous uh, uh, characters in them. Uh, like uh, Mitchell or Procession, in this play you again have six actors who are uh, anonymous. They're all wearing uh, the same dress. Uh, the uh, stage directions are like this. Uh, six actors, identical dress. They may begin with some warm-up exercises to enter into the spirit of the work. This then stand in a circle, hold hands and make eye contact with one another. Then they move and each separately trying to make eye contact with the spectators. At the end they stand in different positions. A melody of four descending notes, each crouches and becomes a seed. Sprouting, standing up, stretching and spreading. Trees, birds singing, wind through the leaves. Two of the actors turn into woodcutters felling trees with the customary heave ho etc. Clearing the jungle, paddy fields, ploughing, sowing, harvesting, then the group forms a machine complete with the rhythms and sounds. So you get a sense that these actors are all trying to use their bodies to create a scene of agricultural labour and work. And uh, they're all uh, busy trying to clear the jungles, trying to cultivate paddy fields. They're sowing and harvesting and so on. Right, so you have the rhythms of agricultural uh, work and labor being uh, embodied in these six actors. So uh, the play has uh, very similar themes, similar to the previous play we discussed, which is again, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, functions as a satire of corruption, of uh, inequality, of injustice. Uh, and uh, Bhal Sarkar does this in uh, many ways. Uh, but primarily through the very intimate connection that the actors establish through their own bodies with the audience. And again, uh, he is making use of an uh, all-round kind of an angan munch where you have audience, the people sitting around the actors, watching them perform. Um, and the actors uh, assume different voices uh, through the play and uh, they also uh, become props uh, where necessary. And the play is also called Bhoma because the Bhoma itself, like Khoka in the previous play, becomes a symbol of many things, right? Uh, he, uh, Bhoma is uh, invisible, but at the same time pervasive uh, symbol of exploitation, of suffering, of disease, of poverty, and of the exploitation more specifically of the rural uh, farmers of the peasants right who have uh, you know uh, soaked this the soil with their own blood as they work to feed the rest of the country right so it's uh, it really is in some sense a an acknowledgement of the and it's also an indictment a satire of the exploitation of the rural masses of the rural peasantry uh, as they invest their sweat and blood in trying to uh, harvest, but of course it's also not a romanticized uh, um, uh, picture of uh, agricultural life, of rural life, but it is also trying to uh, expose the harsh realities of what it means to belong to a rural world, to be a debt-ridden, uh, exploited peasant or farmer who is at the mercy of the state and the government and uh, you know and has to also bear the burden of paying taxes right so uh, or is also at the burden of having to repay loans to the banks and this is also a reality that we see even today with the large and widespread kisan marches that we have of farmers who have to who commit suicide because they are unable to actually 
uh, repay the loans that they have been given by the banks or by the government. So this play in some sense also has a lot of contemporary significance and relevance to the present reality of farmer, uh, ex the exploitation of farmers and farmer suicides. So if you look at the, uh, the voices, the different six voices that, um, uh, of the actors who act in the play, uh, they're, they're largely anonymous voices and they're not, you're not sure what the conversations are about generally. There's, there is no, in fact, as Bal Sarkar himself, himself says in the stage uh, directions of the play, he says that um, I was introduced to the Sundarbans district by Tushar Kanjilal, headmaster of the Rangabelia village school. I had heard Bhoma's story from him. So the story is, uh, this play is inspired from a character called Bhoma that the playwright Bal Sarkar knew uh, from the Sundarban district in uh, West Bengal, southern West Bengal. This is uh, the uh, the kind of mangrove, uh, you know, uh, delta, uh, deltaic plains in the in the mouth of the where the Ganga meets the Bay of Bengal. Right? But Bhuma's story is not there in this play. Seeing, feeling, and learning about our surroundings shock us, hurt us, anger us. These have come out in disjointed dramatic pictures. Bhuma's picture was then part of those pieces. But when those pictures were strung together into a play, then somehow it was Bhuma's image which started to become the link. In the end, the play could not be called anything but Bhuma. When the pieces were being put together as a play, there were others in Shatabdi, that is uh, Bal Sarkar's group, who had also created images out of their experience and feelings which had been incorporated in the play. In that way, Bhuma is not entirely my creation. In this play, there is no character, no story, no continuity. Whatever there is to say, the actors say directly to the audience through sounds, words, and their whole body. That was how Shatabdi staged Bhuma. The first performance was in Rangabelia village on 21st March 1976. Bhuma can be performed by 8 to 10 actors. Shatabdi used 6 actors with another 4 or 5 joining in the singing and in creating sounds. The speeches can be distributed differently in keeping with the resources and requirements of the producing group as long as one consistently, consistently goes on searching for Bhuma and three as in one as in the actor number one consistently goes on searching for Bhuma and actor number three speaks of love. Shatabdi productions have gone through such changes and so on and so forth. Right. So and then you also have two basic tunes, musical tunes that are used in the backdrop of the play. So as Bal Sarkar says, you have a lot of many refrains in the play, the lots of repetitions in the play, which are supposed to impress the memory of the audience with uh, feelings of, uh, of um, you know, of, uh, of deprivation, right? A, a sense of um, protest against uh, deprivation, against, against exploitation and the longing for, for love, to be loved, to be able to bind humanity through love, right? By sharing resources, right? Because the entire play really is about, reflects the uh, inequitable access uh, and distribution of resources between uh, different sections of society. And so this, in some sense, also exposes the uh, social uh, hierarchies, uh, social and economic hierarchies between uh, the haves and the have-nots, right? So, and Boma it becomes a symbol of that sense, that deep sense of exploitation and the protest against exploitation. So uh, there are certain refrains, for example, if you look at page 61, there is uh, uh, actor number two constantly says, uh, there's one discussion which goes on. So one of them is actor number two saying, I'm a stenographer in Samson and Blackbird Company. My salary is now, and, and this uh, line has no punctuation whatsoever. It's one continuous sentence. I am a stenographer in Samsung and Blackbird Company. My salary is now 455 rupees. My take home pay is 428.40 rupees after provident fund deductions. I have a wife, two sons, a daughter, my mother, two young brothers, and a younger sister at home. The elder of the two brothers has passed his BSc, but hasn't got a job in one and a half years. He gets 110 rupees through tuitions. The youngest brother is going to sit for the BA part one examination and sisters in school in class 10. My wife has passed her school final. She cooks my mother, cooks my eldest son, is in class four. And this is how the entire uh, line is, right? So this is uh, repeated off and on, okay? Another uh, refrain that you see uh, in the play is this actor number three uh, constantly saying, 
uh, oh shut up so he can't stand uh, actor number 2's constant uh, complaint or you know this constant uh, reporting a description of his own life right of his own uh, uh, family life so actor number 3 says oh shut up you know i fell in love with a girl now note how language itself breaks down right he's unable to construct a clear, uh, a clear sentence and in the process he gets muddled up and confused and then he is finally silenced you know i have fell in love with a girl the others laugh out aloud three gets mixed up no no a girl fell in love with me i mean a love fell in me a girl i her that is that girl my love i love a girl the laughter has become a roar three puts his hands to his ears i'll kill you laughter becomes louder three falls to the ground the laughter becomes softer and stops in the end right so he's unable to uh, uh, construct a clear sentence confessing uh, the love that he feels for a girl um, because the people are laughing at him right so he's unable to confess his love affair and this again becomes a repeat a repeated uh, a refrain throughout the play a uh, one more refrain of course is this whole discussion about blood right so there's, there's a constant talk about warm blood and cold blood right so actor number 2 says the blood of fish is cold actor number 1 says the blood of man is also cold actor number 3 says no the blood of man is warm actor number 1 says it was before now it's cold theory of evolution darwin had man's blood not grown cold he wouldn't have survived 3 what would he have done then one died become extinct like the dinosaurs three the blood of the dinosaurs was it cold or warm one i don't know three the dinosaur was a reptile wasn't it the blood of a lizard is cold isn't it so this again is another refrain now what do these refrains mean right so for the for the, the last refrain we discussed is about how man has become cold blooded right and that becomes a suggestion of how man has become more and more insensitive he has been desensitized to his own natural uh, environment right through his own social environment he is unable to respond any more to um, the needs of others right the uh, the ecological system right the balance of nature he seems to be primarily responsible for upsetting the balance of nature and even the balance of human life itself right so he he has grown cold blooded simply out of his own desire to survive right so how have men how have people become so cold blooded that they're not able to uh, uh, be sensitive anymore to the needs of others then uh, again like the previous play uh, uh, there is again a satire of uh, nationalism of the, the glory of the nation right so what is india what does india mean to these characters or actors 2 4 5 6 see india see india see india one india two bharatvarsha one mohenjodaro ayodhya patliputra two the city the great city the great 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 city one harappa indraprastha varanasi and 2 4 5 6 cal say calcutta one delhi bombay madras and 2 4 5 6 calcutta one the great 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 city 2 4 5 6 calcutta right so the one of course is the uh, the harking back to the ancient past of the country of the nation uh, in terms of its historical indus valley sites or through the sites of its ancient kingdoms but then there's also this other reference to the metropolitan cities right so the metropolitan cities like delhi bombay madras and calcutta are the ones that uh, get the maximum share of resources they are the ones that are most powerful right they're the ones who have the riches to the rich and uh, calcutta of course it seems to be ambiguous because it is also they're not able to make out whether calcutta is a rural uh, town or an urban city right it seems to have at least during the time when this play was performed they're not sure whether calcutta is a proper city or not right partly because of its power cuts partly because of the water logging that happens during the rains they're not sure whether calcutta is a modern city or not and what does it mean to be a part of a modern city then there are again certain very familiar refrains uh, an actor on number 1 says what what is a sign of urban modernity right so 2 says uh, hindustan mark 2 fiat 1500 the maruti is coming the small car the people's car right so there are all these uh, new technological innovations and amenity, uh, amenities that make a city what it is right so one is the car the people's car one is television uh, one is uh, the metro rail flyovers the second hooghly bridge and so on right so these are all signs apparently of the modern city 
Now, act number number one says, but 75% of India's population live in villages, not in cities. Three, so what? One, village. Three, the village, the lovely village, the charming village, the beautiful village, and so on. Right. So the exoticization of the village, as though the village were this repository of Indian culture, when actually it is not. The village is also not an innocent space of culture. Right. It is. It is already been divided by uh, many differences, many hierarchies of caste, class, and so on. Right. Then one more uh, common refrain in the play is these actors who assume the voices of farmers who need water land, who need money to buy water, right? to pump water from the ground. They need money to buy fertilizers, they need money to buy seeds. Right? So there's one common refrain throughout the play is the voices of the farmers, the poor farmers who don't have any access to credit to uh, get access to these kinds of basic resources which they need for their own life, for their own uh, farming, right? So act number one says, and acres of grey arid land, others grey arid, grey arid, one, a handful of green boro paddy in a sea of grey soil, four, boro paddy, what the hell's that? One, the ravi season paddy, when there is no rain, when the soil is dry, then everybody is at work, movements of drawing water. Two, actor number two, we want water, give us water. We want water, give us water. We want water, give us water. Four, plenty of water deep down in the earth. A lot of water, a lot. Five, who is going, going to draw it? Who will draw it? Who will draw it? Draw it. Two, we need fertilizers, give us fertilizers. We need seeds, give us seeds. We need water, give us water. We need seeds. Four, there's nothing, nothing, nothing. One, no water, no fertilizers, no seeds, no land, no clothes, no food, no water, no work. So you see the, you notice the formulae of that Bhant Sarkar uses uh, when it comes to uh, folk theatre or not folk theatre but you know uh, body centric theatre, theatre which, which focuses on the actor's body. There has to be these constant repetitions, refrains. Right? Then there is another scene in the uh, play which is about the farmers, they need, the poor farmers desperately need loans from banks in order to buy uh, water pumps, water pumps that are fueled by diesel, right? But diesel is expensive. And they're unable to get loans to buy water pumps because they don't have any security, right? They don't have any assets that they can give to the bank in exchange for uh, loans, right? So they are struggling with that also. So actor number one, for example, says, that he talks about the sorry state of farmers in uh, the district of 24 Paraganas in uh, West Bengal. There are 250 families in the village of which 60 families have each less than an acre of land. 90 families have no land at all. They work on other people's lands as hired laborers. They get 4 rupees a day as wages. Each of these laborers has 5, 6, 10 dependents. At 4 rupees a day, you can't afford to buy rice, wheat, yes, but not enough for chapatis. If you make a porridge of it with water and salt, it goes a long way and fills you up. If you can't get wheat flour, there's corn flour. If you can't even get hold of that, you starve. You can't always get a 4 rupees a day job, maybe at most for 100 or 125 days a year. Nowadays, thanks to tube wells and pumps to draw out ground, ground water for irrigation, you get some spring crop, crops, wheat, ravi paddy. So there's some work even in April and May, but then there's no electricity. If it's a diesel pump, diesel is expensive and you don't get it always. You don't get fertilizers. The price of fertilizers has doubled. Urea used to be 1 rupee 15 paise per kg at the control rate. Now it's 1 rupee 95 paise per kg. Then, uh, again, actor number one says, please, please, I haven't finished my story yet. There is no electricity, but there are the poles and wires all these three years. Now the poles have, have come loose. The wires are used as clothes, as clothes lines by the villagers. If we get electricity, if the canals are dredged, if we have more tube wells, only 3 million rupees, then the whole of the Simulpur Anchal, all the 3,000 acres of land will yield gold, gold. The second Hooghly Bridge, actor number two says, the second Hooghly Bridge, when shall we have it? Actor three, the stadium, when shall we have it? Actor four, the metro rail, when shall we have it? Actor one, listen, listen, you get seven quintals of the old Kharif per acre if you depend on the rain alone. 
So one crop a year yields only seven quintals per acre. While the high yield paddy, wheat and vegetables, three crops a year, the same plot of land yields four times as much of it if there's water. That's only three million rupees. Actor two, the second Hooghly Bridge, only 600 million rupees. Actor three, Diggy and Calcutta for better streets and better sewers, only 2,000 million rupees spent so far. Actor four, the metro rail will cost only 3,000 million rupees. One, actor number one, only one, only three million, I've calculated it, only three million for the Simulpur Anchal. So there's this constant refrain asking that, uh, imagining that they only need three million rupees to be able to uh, buy uh, diesel pumps that will help them pump water from the ground. Right. Uh, if they have three million rupees, right, they only need in just about enough. Uh, they, they, it'll be enough to get electricity to dredge the canals, right. And if they have more tube wells, then they hope that the entire district of Simulpur will yield crops, will yield a lot of uh, food grains, right. And that is their dream, right. But. They, this, these are all empty dreams, right? They, they never get fulfilled. They're all empty promises, empty dreams. They're, they're just these elusive promises the government makes uh, to the uh, farmers and peasantry, but that never happens. While the city seems to be spending a lot more money on its technology in terms of the Hooghly Bridge or the Metro Rail, but they're not willing to spend uh, even half the amount for agriculture and for the survival of the rural masses. Uh, then when uh, some of the uh, poor farmers go to, uh, you know, uh, not poor farmers, but the, 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 the manufacturers of the parts of this diesel pump, when they go to ask for a loan from the bank, the bank wants to first know uh, what uh, security, what assets they have that they can give to the bank in exchange for the loan. Four, actor number four says, Sir, can we get some loan from your bank? Five, how much? Four, say, 20,000. Five, and who are you? Four, Mahamaya Engineering Company. Sir, Belilius Road, Haura. Five, what do you manufacture? Four, we make diesel pump sets, sir. Sam Bird. Five, horsepower. Five, angrily, but that's made by Samson and Blackbird Company. Four, yes, sir, it's sold by Samson and Blackbird Company. We supply them. Five parts, four, oh no sir, not just parts. We assemble the whole set. We even stick their name plate for them. We even prepare the specification literature for them and supply it printed and ready. 236, Sambert, Sambert. One, diesel pump set. 236, Sambert, Sambert. One, 4,625 rupees only. The machine starts again. Four, we get 2,500 from them. Even that is not paid in cash. They pay us only after sets are sold. So we're always short of capital to make new sets. That's why we need this loan, sir. Five, the bank interest rate is 14% now. Four, we know it's 14%, sir. That's why we ask for it. We don't get it below 35% from the private money lenders. What are your assets, five asks. Four says, assets, sir. Well, the factory shed is there. Five, how big? Four, 1,100 square feet, sir. Five, your own or rented? Four, there's a 20 years lease in the land, sir, but the shed is ours. Five, how many workers? Four, we have 28 working now, including the unskilled labor. And so on and so forth, right? So they need a, a loan from the bank because they don't have enough capital. I mean, they don't, they, don't, they don't have enough money. They don't get enough money from the sale of these uh, pump sets because they're not paid in cash. They're only paid in cash after pump sets are sold to the farmers. So they're always short of capital, which is why they need a loan. But then the bank is not willing to give them money without securities or assets. Five asks, the banker asks, in that case, what will the security, what, what will be the security here? Four says, we'll repay the 6,000 from the 20,000 of that the loan we get and get the shed back for you, sir. With the remaining 14,000, we shall meet the new order we've already got. In the meantime, we are sure to get the 17,000 they owe us for old consignments. Five, nothing doing. Four, sir. Five, you can't have it without security. Get the shed back first. If everything else is satisfactory, you can get up to 10,000 on it. They're not able to get a loan uh, from the bank. Right? And finally, the, the machine itself seems to break down. Right? So uh, the five, the banker says, if we give you a loan without any security, the bank will have to be closed. What about that? Again, picks up the phone, speaks. Hello, Mukherjee. One lakh thirty thousand at twelve percent to Samsung and Blackbird Company. Yes. 
puts down the phone then announces sambal diesel pump set power unlimited crops unlimited unlimited water the lowest cost the farmer's friend sambal in the meantime four comes and puts his hand on the to the machine it breaks down four also breaks down beside it a tune tune to one and two get up slowly eyes closed palms touching barely moving slowly to a common rhythm okay so the the machine, the machine itself breaks down towards the end earlier of blood so act number 2 act number 1 says my my heart bleeds can a drop of it germinate even a prickly thorn on this earth two this earth has sucked up so much blood already hasn't it one yes hollow earth deep down deep down drop by drop this blood has seeped through and gathered in a subterranean reservoir two from deep down the earth comes the water which turns a small patch of the vast gray wasteland into green in april one water from deep down the underworld two who draws it up who draws it up five sam bird two does the summer crop grow on blood one drops of blood trickle down the golden ears of corn two golden corn that's what you see only through train windows and so on then look at the uh, plight of uh, poorer farmers who don't have enough land to cultivate crops uh they are poor one asks is that your own pump set two good heavens no sir where could i get it i have only one acre of land sir and that to mortgage the money lender what can i get bank loan on remember the loans that these farmers get from money lenders have a much higher rate of interest of 35% number uh, one says who's the pump set then two gadai mitters he doesn't have much land this side so he sells water one what's the price hike two this year it's risen to 7 rupees per hour till till last year we got it for 5 for poor people like us it's crazy to cultivate paddy in the dry season you can call it beggars craving to ride horses say i have hardly an acre and it's going to cost me at least 1200 rupees for water alone on top of that there are fertilizers pesticides but then with good luck if there's not much trouble with pests with your good wishes sir it's not going to be too bad how did gadai mitter get his own pump act number 1 asks act two replies ah uh, for him it's easy enough he has more than 25 acres of land he had a rustan pump already 5 horse power and last year he took a loan from the bank and brought the sunbird 36 sunbird sambird 5 nationalized banks in the service of agriculture 4 a running factory for sale going cheap 1 those fields there do they belong to gadai mitter 2 no sir they, these land, the, the land belongs to three different people gadai mitter uh cultivates those on share cropping terms one what a rich man like gadai mitter a share cropper to well sir it's a different kind of share cropping those people have no money how can they cultivate in the dry season the land would have lain fa- fallow if left to them so gadai mitter cultivates it on a share basis gives them 3 quintals per acre one only 3 from a yield that's going to be at least 20 quintals Two, yes, sir. That's how things are in the villages. If I don't have any luck this year, that's what's going to happen to me next year. What's to be done, sir? We have no money. So you see the importance that money that uh, that money has in the rural economy. If they don't have any money, then poor farmers who uh, cannot grow anything uh, in the dry season have to become uh, sharecroppers for richer farmers like Gadai Mitter, and they have to work on their. Uh, on the on the lands of richer farmers as hired laborers and they get a very small share of the land that they cultivate uh, because uh, they are being exploited right so the 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 uh, the on they 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 are unable to cultivate anything in dry season and that is when they are uh, most susceptible to exploitation right uh, so the uh, very fabric of the rural economy seems to depend on getting bank loans and being able to repay bank loans uh, uh, on very low interest rates right because they don't have any assets or securities against which they can get loans right? so it becomes this vicious cycle of uh, of debt and poverty on page 82 and 83 again uh, there is this constant refrain of the i right so here it's again there is this discussion of who bhuma is 3 4 actor 3 4 5 6 ask who is bhuma one bhuma is a bhuma is one bhuma is i can't bhuma i just can't put you into neat and tidy formula two there is no bhuma 3 4 5 6 there's no bhuma no bhuma no bhuma one there's no bhuma there's only i three no no it's i four no no not you it's i four oh no it's i six stop stop it's i i i i i 
right now there's this constant uh, this this contrast between the uh, individualism right the individualism that comes with privilege with economic privilege economic comforts right that you are you don't care for others you're a you're a you're a selfish eye right but then you also have bhoma which represents many eyes right the bhoma is also symbol a plural symbol of many eyes of many people of many poor farmers and peasants who have been exploited who have suffered the uh, plight of poverty and and being detrimental right so in some sense bhoma is also a symbol of these different uh, of the rural of the exploited rural folk and masses and uh, there's also an 84 a satire of how a lot of the hard earned money the taxes that people play pay are going towards sending students to kanpur delhi bombay madras to the prestigious iits right so they're being sent to iits to educate and the entire uh, country nation seems to be selling its pots and pans to send them and then abroad to be educated further the other problem in the play has to do with the problem of nuclear war right can uh, the production of uh, nuclear power have any peaceful and harmless consequences right it seems impossible that even if nuclear power is being used for peaceful and harmless uh, you know uses as for example for you know production of power then it still seems to harm the environment so the the harm that uh, that humans uh, create towards the environment becomes in terms of radio radioactivity becomes another problem in the play right and there's always there's also this uh, nightmare that haunts humanity in uh, terms of the hero the bombs that were atomic bombs that were uh, that were uh, dropped on hiroshima and nagasaki in terms of the generations of deformed children that were produced from the bomb blast right so there's this fear of uh, disease uh, and uh, deformation right so one actor one says explosive explosion or peaceful use there will be the ashes atomic waste how will you tackle its radioactivity three all that's going to be destroyed one how by sealing it in a lead box and thrusting it down a salt mine that's what is done but how many salt mines are there on this earth 2 4 5 6 this earth one how many are going to be left three crap all this is crap one even then the minimum time it will take for the radioactivity to to be destroyed is 400 years do you know the maximum time it can take three how much one 24000 years three stunt 24 one 24000 years human civilization is only 5000 years old within this time man has made arrangements for the next 24000 years 2 4 5 6 a rejoice 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 one 24000 years if you calculate 12 years as an age then 2000 ages the atomic advance in this world lived for ages right so it's obviously a parody a satire of how human beings have apparently taken care of the next 24000 years when it, which is the time it takes to for uh, nu- for nuclear waste to be uh, to disintegrate to destroy radioactivity and this constant refrain that then the play in terms of you know farmers who need water uh, can you give me a drop of water is being juxtaposed to the amount that the country seems to spend on uh, its technology in nuclear power right and uh, there's a stark contrast uh, an irony between the two that the, the country is willing to spend millions of rupees on bridges on ha- flyovers on nuclear power but is not willing to uh, make its priorities clear by spending money even the smallest amount on agriculture and on the lives of the rural of uh, masses right so there's there's no money for uh, to provide them uh, there's no there are no loans to be given interest free loans to be given to farmers for them to be able to uh, acquire diesel pumps that will give them access to water from the ground during the dry season right so there's something as basic as this is not being taken care of and then they are actually the nation seems to be more interested in producing uh, radioactive nuclear power which has produced uh, deformed generations of children and then bhoma here on 94 who bhoma is becomes clear when act number 1 says bhoma is the jungle bhoma is the corn field bhoma is the village three quarters of india's population live in villages billions and billions of bhomas in the cities we live on the blood of bhomas so here it's become very clear that bhoma represents the blood the exploited rural masses and of course the play ends with uh, the with the the actual bhoma that bal sarkar had heard about the bhoma from the sundarban 
and again the play ends on this note of how the sundarban a natural landscape of mangroves is being destroyed in the human desire to expand further expand the cultivation of their lands the cultivable land right so many forests are being destroyed uh, animals like the tigers and the snakes and crocodiles are being ruined are being destroyed the habitat is being ruined and there are people who live in the sundarban who are also being uh, trapped between the expansionism of urban uh, modernity of the urban modern world of urban modernism of uh, technology and on the one hand and on, and on the other hand there are also the victims of tigers and crocodiles so you're talking about a section of people who live uh, in indigenous communities who live in the sundarban who are constantly being displaced and exploited by human civilization but also by uh, the animals uh, that they cohabit with right act number 1 says no not any longer it's not a forest now the forest now is cleared jungle hassle 2 3 4 6 hassle what do you mean one the orangs the mundas the santhals the aboriginals the jungle hassle the forest cleared the forest cleared to make way for abad for cultivation 3 4 5 3 2 3 4 6 ask abad what's that so that is the cultivation the 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 chopping of trees the deforestation of the land and the clearing of the land for cultivation bhuma who's bhuma bhuma's hungry bhuma wants rice sir ask them to make it for him who's bhuma bhuma who's that bhuma bhuma of the sundarbans who's bhuma bhuma who's that when bhuma was 16 he came to clear the forest father mother and two kid brothers the jungle of the sundarbans let the rice cook sir bhuma will rest the jungle hassan the sundarbans the principal speaker today is dr sarbhanga sundar sundaraya chief planning advisor sundarban planning commission when bhuma was 20 the tree that he could fell alone in 3 hours two men couldn't work a whole day through right so bhuma is that also that man from the sundarbans who is uh, again one of those many endangered uh, indigenous populations uh, whose uh, habitat is being threatened by uh by uh, urban society now the the uh, bhuma is also someone who has left the sundarban in search of education in search of jobs has come back to sundarbans and is also again responsible for the clearing of the forest for the purposes of cultivation so bhuma represents many things right it also represents the transitions that uh, population certain populations make from their indigenous habitats to cities the migrations that happen the displacements that happen the exploitation of these displaced populations uh the, uh the 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 aspirations of young men and women who come from these populations from these regions of the world to uh to to cities in search of employment and education so there's again this interesting contrast between the rise of the rate of interest the unfair distribution of investments the uh, the disaster of inflation right hunger poverty and that is also being contrasted to uh, bhuma bhuma's mother died of snake bite snake bite his father was dragged away by a crocodile before his very eyes the younger younger brother couldn't stand the tamarind and salt water mixture and died of diarrhea bhuma is blind in the right eye there's a gaping hole where his right cheek was the tiger is also dead killed by bhuma's axe and his brothers the brother next to bhuma is still living he lives in the aboriginal neighborhood of the village of rangabedia he's landless and an agricultural labor he gets work only 90 days a year at 3 rupees a reality a day so bhuma represents these different realities uh, realities of a family that has been that has been uh, killed by snakes or by crocodiles uh, bhuma who is who uh, who was once who survived a tiger attack right uh, bhuma whose brother uh, you know lives in the neighborhood in the neighborhood but he is a landless agricultural labor who a like, laborer who only gets work 90 days a year so the problems of seasonal employment of farmers right so you have all these problems that bhuma represents and embodies so the sundarban in some sense becomes that very precarious place that is threatened both by uh, uh, urban expansionism uh, and by uh, the nat- the forces of nature right so the land is gone the crops are gone the salt water remember it's all salt water so you can't uh, cultivate too much when you have salt water when you have the the water of the bay of bengal moving into the river and spreading into these different islands 
uh, you have salt water, the land is gone, the crops are gone, homes are gone. Three says an acre of my land was eaten away by the Bidhya River three years ago. Four, but we have to pay revenue still on that piece of land. Two, and we will have to go on paying to the next government survey. Three, my land was eaten away by the Bidhya Vidha. So look at the plight of these uh, indigenous communities who are, um, uh, you know, threatened by natural uh, calamities, uh, by the shifting coast of the river, by uh, the problems of, of brackish uh, salt water on which they can't cultivate anything. And on the other hand, they have forced to, to repay the loans that they owe the government. Right? So they have all these problems. Right? So play does a very uh, sensitive job of, of, uh, of uh, exposing the social realities of endangered, uh, displaced communities like them that are always on the verge of, uh, of, of bankruptcy, of debt, uh, of death, right? both by natural forces and diseases. Actor 1 asks, no wait. We can't really just tell now whether man's blood is cold or warm. Not yet. Perhaps, perhaps. No, it's again getting confused, becoming a tangle, a mess. Who is Boma? An Aboriginal and barbarian woodcutter? Why should I bother with? Why should we go to him and? Five, Boma wants to eat, sir. Eat rice. One, how can you eat Boma? If you eat rice, we won't get our delicious biryanis. A queer picture for one rupee, a picture for ten rupees, pictures for ten, twenty, hundred rupees. We have brought up your blood with these pictures, Boma. We have brought up the rice and taken it away from your mouth. No, no, wait a minute. Again, everything is becoming confused. Then, actor one, this earth belongs to every, everybody, all of us, doesn't it, Boma? You wielded your axe, killed tigers, got mauled by the tiger, so that you could dig some rice out from the niggardly fist of this earth. Didn't you, Boma, this earth? This earth. Yes, yes, this earth. This earth belongs to all of us, doesn't it, Boma? If, if we all of us could work our hardest to make everything we need, and then all of us shared all we produced, then that queer picture that lets us buy up your blood to drink, the picture that you don't have and therefore can't get your rice, if we could destroy for that forever that queer, obscure, obscene picture, I can't explain it, Boma. I can only understand if you don't rise up with your axe, the forest of poisonous trees will never be cleared. My Abad, our Abad, the Abad is in a splendor of gold and green, the Abad of our dreams. Boma, Boma, Boma. Right? So here, Abad also acquires the connotation of, of being clear. What are you clearing? You're clearing not just the land, you're also clearing the very notion of private property. Right? Of, uh, yes, I mean, it, it's, it's exactly that, that if the earth belonged to all of us, if we shared all our resources, if we shared all that we produced, then there would not be, there would be no room for, uh, for competition, right, for rivalry, for individualism. There would be no room for uh, hierarchies, right? So, the play actually seems to end on that very uh, socialist uh, and communist note, right? One says, hungry, hungry. Boma lies almost lifeless with hunger. Boma the beggar. His axe is rusty. All around there grows a jungle of poisonous weeds and parasites. Poison. There's the smell of poison in the air. There's the taste of Boma's blood on the tongue. We drink Boma's blood and laugh and play. There's blood dripping down the sides of our mouths. Dripping, dripping. The poisonous plants are growing, growing. My blood, man's blood, becomes cold, cold, cold. But Boma is there. I know Boma is there. I know that's why I have dreams. Dreams. Boma has risen. Boma has risen. He has taken up his dusty axe. He's grinding it, sharpening it. There are forests all around him. There's the forest in Boma's eyes. Boma's grip becomes stronger. The vice of the grip presses harder on the handle of the axe. The torn eye lights up with the fire that killed the tiger. Boma is rising. We are rising. The forest, the forest, the forest of poisonous tree, of poison trees. Pick up your axe, Boma. It's too heavy. I can't pick it up. You pick it up, Boma. Come on, hit it. Heave ho. Right? So the uh, play actually ends on these uh, woodcutters who are uh, chopping down these poisonous trees that have taken on the uh, environment, the habitat of the Sundarban. But these poisonous trees aren't, uh, you know, literally poisonous trees. They're also symbolic of uh, the, uh, the danger that... Uh, that urban societies, that uh, urban modernism, that the state poses uh, in the forays, in the incursion, incursions it makes into 
uh, these other marginalized uh, habitats, right? these, these, these uh, ecosystems that are fragile and that have been rendered fragile and endangered by the activities of the state uh, and, and urban uh, cities, right? So, in some sense, a play exposes the realities of uh, the inequalities, the structural inequalities between the city and the, and the non-city spaces, right? And the Boma in some, becomes a symbol of just that, of, of, of exploitation, of poverty. It also becomes a symbol of hope that perhaps if we could all be, be uh, Bhomas, then we would actually be able to, we would realize that the need to share resources, to, to, uh, to be able to have an equitable uh, distribution of resources so that we can all, um, you know, uh, in some sense, uh, cohabit habit live together uh, in, uh, with, in, in, with a greater sense of peace and, and, uh, and harmony, right? So that was actually Bal Sarkar's play called Bhuma. Thank you.